Hello and welcome to News Click. The results of the European parliamentary elections are out. And while the traditional power blocks, both to the center left and the center right, have suffered damages, the prospect many people were fearing, the dominance of the far right, has been averted for now. To talk more about this, we have with us D. Raghunandan, political analyst. Raghu, thank you for joining us. So, could you first give an outline of the results and what you think are the key trends that we have seen in this election? Yeah. Well, as you said, I think the key trends are that the center, both the center right and the center left, have lost ground. Right. Uh, and it was feared, some may have expected, mm -hmm. that the far right and the nationalist parties would have gained right. at a European level, mm -hmm. which hasn't happened. Okay. But I think the more interesting trend uh, is that the big gainers mm -hmm. in this, the biggest gainers have been the Greens, right. uh, who have gained uh, virtually across uh, Western and Northern uh, right. Europe, and they have recorded significant gains. And uh, the other big gainers have been the Liberals, mm -hmm. uh, which is significant because it marks a major turn in European parliamentary uh, politics. Right. For the first time, the center parties of the left and the right, mm -hmm. between them don't have a majority of seats. Right. So when it comes to important legislative decisions, when it comes to choosing the main office bearer posts in Europe, that's the European in Commission, Commission right president, the European Council president, and importantly, the governor of the European Central Bank, uh -huh, right. which has to be decided and uh, ratified by the parliament. Mm -hmm. This is not going to happen just by a coalition of the center right and the center left. Right. And in order to form a winning coalition, mm -hmm. uh, which would vote on European lines, uh, there would have to be a coalition between the center right and center left and either the Greens or the Liberal Liberals. Democrats right. or both. Right. And I think the significance of this lies in the fact that these four, mm -hmm. uh, the center parties, the Liberals and the Greens are all the pro-European parties. Mm -hmm. Whereas the nationalist parties, the far right parties, right. etc are the euro skeptics mm -hmm. uh, who are likely to pull in different directions. Right. So one of the key narratives ahead of this election was the possible rise of the far right. So like you talked about in Germany, in the UK, Italy, France, and in many of these countries, we did see them actually dominating. For instance, in I think France and Italy, they were the leaders and in yeah. the UK too. Yeah. So what sort of implication do you think this rise has on the domestic politics of these countries and on Europe as a whole? Yeah. Well, uh, till now, the dominance of the far right has uh, been restricted mostly to the uh, new entrants into the uh, European Union. Right. Whereas the EU 15, mm -hmm. the original members, mm -hmm. were not so affected by this problem, except for France, right. with the strong showing of the National Front Rally. National, yeah. which is now called the National Rally. Right. Uh, but now you've got the Brexit party mm -hmm. uh, and you've got strong showing from Italy, uh, of course. So these three parties in Western Europe mm -hmm. have pushed up the numbers mm -hmm. of the far right. The only thing is that so far, given the fact that the key driving forces mm -hmm. behind these far right uh, movements right tend to be nationally restricted mm -hmm. and they share perhaps only one common thread which is a Euro skepticism. Right. But uh, Nigel Farage's party is the only party that actually wants to leave mm -hmm. the EU. No other far right party has indicated a desire to quit. Right. But they want a greater assertion of national sovereignty. Mm -hmm compared to a centralization of a European right. identity. Right. But I think all the far right parties would find it very difficult to work together as a bloc, right. because I think they don't share mm -hmm. as much ideologically as it may appear from the outside. Right. 
Le Pen's party, the Front National in France, has been consistently reluctant to join any other far-right mm -hmm. grouping because it thinks it has a unique right. uh, role and a place to play which is central to French society rather than uh, having a common European, European thread right. or a pan-European mm -hmm. uh, thread. So I think that there is, while in the national contexts, mm -hmm. there is a considerable amount to be worried about the far right at a European level, right. in legislative uh, terms, mm -hmm. they may not be that much to be concerned about right. because I think the concerns of each of the individual mm -hmm. parties, mm -hmm. ranging from populism to a far-right conservative agenda to extreme nationalism, I think vary so much that they would find it difficult to work together as a bloc. Right. And, but one of the issues many of these parties seem to have a uh, common understanding on is the issue of migration. Yeah. So would you see the, uh, see the, 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 the movements against migrants and the xenophobia actually increasing in the aftermath of these results and success for them? Um, see, the, the sentiments about immigration have actually been rising in Europe for some time, even among the centrist parties. Mm -hmm. And it's not a concern confined to the far right. The far right have made it a central point of their agenda right. and also made it a uh, uh, xenophobic uh, issue. Right. Whereas the concerns about immigration have even been central to many of the centrist parties, the Conservative Party in the UK, right. uh, uh, for example, uh, the CSU in uh, Germany, Germany uh, have been concerned. But now, the concerns about immigration, including the populist parties and the far right parties and so on, have certainly come to occupy a more central place in the European discourse mm -hmm. uh, than before. And I think that the centrist parties are finding it increasingly difficult to sound pro-immigration. Right. The stance that uh, Germany's Angela Merkel uh, took when uh, migration from North Africa and the Middle East was at its peak as pro-immigration, uh, as you know, took quite a beating right. uh, in Germany as well as elsewhere in Europe, as a result of which uh, Angela Merkel herself has had to retreat from that mm -hmm. uh, position. And I think there are few parties in Europe today which can take a very openly pro-immigration starts. Right. And one of the other key issues in this election was, of course, uh, around centered around climate. Yeah. And one of the major victors uh, in this election, like you pointed out, has been the Green parties right. across the continent. That's right. So how do you see the rise of uh, these parties and what are the advantages and limitations there? Yeah. Uh, well, firstly, the Greens have registered a very dramatic uh, rise, although in percentage terms, the rise of the Greens is matched by the lies of the Liberals mm -hmm. uh, in this election. But the Greens have shown uh, across the board, not just in terms of representation in the European Parliament, but in terms of the votes polled, uh, a significant rise. For example, in Dublin uh, City, uh, it was the Green Party candidate who had the highest percentage of votes, somewhere around 26 or 27 uh, percent. I think uh, environmental concerns, particularly on climate, uh, have become even more central in Europe today than they were earlier. And in particular, uh, the concern is that whereas earlier uh, many parties of the center left, even of the center right, in Germany for example, uh, have shown pro-environmental uh, concerns, uh, concerns about climate change. These have been, uh, frankly, more rhetorical than actually in action. Right. And what the Greens have said now is that they are now keen to ensure that legislatively and through executive action, these are translated into positive uh, laws 
okay. and actions right. to ensure that the laws are actually followed. Mm -hmm. So I think one can see uh, in the months and years to come a more concerted European stance right. in favor of positive action on climate change mm -hmm. and on sustainability issues in uh, within uh, Europe. Right. But the Greens also have not just environmental issues, mm -hmm. but social justice issues mm -hmm. as a central platform and have made what they call social Europe uh, a central slogan right. uh, for them, which along with human rights makes a triumvirate of issues which the Greens mm -hmm. uh, look forward to. If you ask me today in Europe, a young person who likes to think of himself or herself as radical would vote green. Right. Uh, and that's what these show. However, it should be noted that the success of the Greens is largely restricted to Western and Northern Europe. Uh, they have very little presence in Spain, marginal presence in Portugal, and virtually no existence at all in Eastern Europe uh, right. or Southern Europe. Mm -hmm. So they have very little in Italy, very little in Hungary, Poland, uh, etc. So this is also to be taken into account that this is centered around the better off right. uh, part of Europe uh, in uh, Central and Northern uh, Europe as a phenomenon. So one will have to really wait for this to spread to other parts of the EU 27. Right. And uh, finally, to look at the uh, other section we not talked much about, that's the left. They yeah. actually suffered a bit in terms yes. of their overall number of seats and voting percentage. Yes. And this has also happened when, for instance, there have been popular mobilizations across the continent, the True. Yellow Wests being the most primary example. True. So what could be the reasons for this and what would be the challenges for the left? See, to my mind, in the popular imagination in Europe, nationally, uh, there are very few countries where the left has a significant right. uh, electoral uh, presence. However, and this is a phenomenon which I think we are familiar with in this country as well as in other countries, the left has a greater role in the popular imagination uh, than it does in representative politics and electoral right. politics. And I think that is the role in Europe also. When there are anti-capitalist movements in Europe, when there are environmentalist movements in Europe, and many movements where these two coalesce mm -hmm. uh, together, the left imagination or left ideas plays a very strong role. Uh, in fact, I think viewers also need to know that apart from the Greens, there is a coalition of parties in the European Parliament uh, which call themselves Left Green. Right, the Nordic Greens. The Nordic right. uh, Greens, exactly. And they have a fairly significant presence in the European mm -hmm. uh, Parliament, which reflects a lot of the left imagination in Western and Northern Europe, which is also a combination of left and environmental right. uh, imagination. That's where the younger population, uh, younger and radical populations of Europe seem to identify themselves certainly in electoral uh, politics. Right. I think uh, one will have to wait for quite some time more before the strong conceptual and ideological presence of the left in popular consciousness mm -hmm. Uh, recovers the kind of electoral representation right. the left used to have right. a few decades ago. Right. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.